I would now like to introduce Dr. Victor Shoup, who will be sharing his remarks about blockchain and fully homomorphic encryption. Dr. Shoup is a cryptography professor at Columbia University, and please join me in welcoming him. Hi, so I'm actually a professor at NYU and not Columbia. Um, that's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm also currently acting as an advisor for Cryptic Labs. Um, so my talk today is, uh, I don't have any company or software to sell, but, but I have some ideas that I wanna uh, maybe get you to think about and hopefully uh, later some people might have some ideas that they can tell me if any of this makes sense or not. So like I said, it's kind of speculative, um, but I'm in academia, so that's okay. Um, so I want to start by talking about smart contracts. So um, one way to think about a smart contract, maybe it's super general, is that you've got some state information that is going to evolve over time. Maybe it's implicitly represented. Um, and then you've got an input Y, and then you want to update your state, right? So that kind of, you think about it as just taking the current state X, uh, an input Y, applying some transformation function F, and then you have a new state X, right? So I guess in a blockchain, kind of Y would get uh, recorded in the blockchain, and then uh, anybody evaluating uh, this thing would be able to update X as you go along. Um, the state X actually, you know, might consist of several components, so uh, we might have two components, X1 and X2, and then you have two inputs, Y1 and Y2, and then one execution of the smart contract would simultaneously uh, validate some relationship between Y1 and Y2 and then update X1 and X2. So maybe, for example, uh, you might be able to, in one step, uh, one execu execution of the contract, you know, add one to X1 and subtract one from X2. That would be kind of a typical example. But I want to think about these transformation functions, uh, F or F1 and F2, as being completely general for the time being. So the types of computation that need to be done then on the blockchain for these uh, executions of these smart contracts are just to take a current state and input Y and compute F of XY, or in the joint state example, this more complicated thing. Um, an earlier talk today did talk about privacy, so they've already introduced this topic and motivated it pretty well. What about privacy? So on the blockchain, everything is just there for everything to, everybody to see. So if you want to um, uh, hide some of this data from uh, the world, there's several different ways you might do it. In the earlier talk today, um, they had one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is simply to encrypt everything. That's kind of maybe the first thing you might think of. So. In this example, uh, where we have the state X and input Y, and then we want to compute the updated state F of X, Y, suppose that instead of knowing the state, the contract executor just knows an encryption of the state. And instead of knowing the input Y, the contract executor just knows an encryption of Y. And from this, he's somehow supposed to compute an encryption of the updated state F of X, Y. Encryption of X, encryption of Y, somehow compute an encryption of f of x, y. And this is what the corresponding computation would look like in this joint state example, where we have, uh, I wish I had a, a pointer, where um, yeah, we have these in various encryptions and then we, have, we output these encryptions. Okay, so that makes sense. A um, Couple of questions one might ask, I'm talking about en encrypting this data, so if this is a public key encryption scheme, uh, then who controls the, the secret keys, the decryption keys? Another question is uh, how to implement this encryption scheme. Um, let me just, this is not the main point of what I want to talk about, but it's certainly, uh, one has to think about this is who, in, in these examples, okay, my examples are kind of abstract, but who controls the decryption keys? And I guess it depends on the application. One, one possibility is that nobody controls the decryption keys or rather, um, we might have public key encryption schemes where the secret keys are distributed among uh, a, a set of servers, and these servers have to cooperate in some way using some kind of threshold decryption scheme to actually decrypt um, uh, the data. 
Another possibility in this joint state scenario that I mentioned where we are encrypting X1 and Y1 and X2 and Y2 and we compute the updated encryption is that, that maybe just individuals hold, somebody holds the decryption key for the first encryption scheme, somebody else for the second decryption scheme, and then um, as the state evolves, then these individual ciphertexts for the state get updated and then the individuals who own those uh, uh, decryption keys can decrypt these individual encrypted records at an appropriate time. But I guess the point in this example is that um, the parties that control the decryption keys don't have to be um, involved at all in the computation while the blockchain is being updated. They can be completely offline and just come in at any time that they want to decrypt these things. So like I said, how that works really depends on the application. Um, the other kind of more daunting question is how to actually implement this encryption scheme. So really what we're talking about here is how to compute on encrypted data. This is also known as um, uh, homomorphic encryption. Um, so Witt talked about this, mentioned it briefly this morning. Um, there's a couple of different ways of thinking about homomorphic encryption. One type is a more limited type of homomorphic encryption, uh, which has been around since the 80s and 90s where if you're given an encryption of some number x and some number y, you can compute the encryption of their sum or the encryption of their product. But you can't, but, but until fairly recently, we didn't know how to implement an encryption scheme that would allow you to do both addition and multiplication on encrypted data. Fully homomorphic encryption is a much more interesting um, type of encryption. It allows you to do both addition and multiplication on encrypted data. And once you can do addition and multiplication, that's kind of a complete set of operations, just like if you have and or not, you can build any Boolean circuit that implements any function. Once you have both addition and multiplication, you can actually implement arbitrary functions, which means that you can take any function you like and apply it to the encrypted data and get an encryption of the function applied to the original data. So for many years, this was an uh, open question as to whether or not this could be done in any reasonable fashion under any reasonable assumptions. The first breakthrough in this field came in 2009 um, by Craig Gentry, who invented the first plausible um, implementation of this idea. And there's been many practical improvements since then. Um, I've been working for quite a while with um, the folks at IBM. Craig Gentry is there, and there's a number of other people there who work on this stuff. And I've been involved in working with uh, trying to implement a, a, a library uh, that actually implements fully homomorphic encryption, not just the encryption and decryption functions, but a, a wide variety of, of um, func uh, software modules that allow you to do various things on the encrypted data. Um, as I'll show you in the next slide, there's still a long way to go. The original proposals for homomorphic encryption schemes were crazy inefficient, very inefficient, although polynomial time, but so theoretically it could be done. But um, so it's still kind of a, a work in progress. We're still trying to take this crazy inefficient idea and make it practical. Um, and like I said, most of the work that I do at IBM is with a, a colleague of mine, Shai Halevi, who uh, together, we've been working on uh, writing the software and design, designing the algorithms and, and writing the software. So in addition to writing research papers on this stuff, I spend a lot of time just writing a lot of code. Um, let me give you an idea for how inefficient <laughs> this stuff currently is. Um, it's not the usual approach, I guess, to selling one's wares, but okay. Uh, so one ciphertext in this scheme consists of two polynomials. So a polynomial is just really a, a vector of coefficients. The degree or the size, the number of elements in these vectors is big, like 25 to 30,000. It needs to be that big in order to ensure the security of the scheme. Each of these coefficients has a few hundred bits in it, 500 to 1,000, maybe actually a little bit less depending on the application. 
Uh, yeah, so one ciphertext consists of two polynomials. Each polynomial has 25 to 50,000 coefficients. Each of those is 500 to 1,000 bits. So if I did the multiplication correctly and added things upright, this is one ciphertext is like between 3 and 12.5 megabytes. So not exactly small. Um, the one saving grace here is that the way this particular crypto system works is that, okay, the ciphertexts are huge, but you can actually encrypt a lot of data using the ciphertext. So each ciphertext really is encrypting a vector of between, again, it depends on a lot of factors, but between, say, a 500 and 2,000 numbers. So each ciphertext is actually an encryptor, is, is an encryption of a vector of numbers of this size. Um, so since we're working with these vectors, what happens if you want to multiply two ciphertexts together, what happens really is what's happening is that uh, I have one ciphertext encrypting a vector of numbers, another ciphertext encrypting a vector of numbers, and then you apply a special algorithm to that, and you get out a ciphertext that, that encrypts the vector whose components are the component-wise products of the, um, the numbers in the original vectors, or either product or sum. So it's as if you had a, uh, a machine that supported uh, uh, SIMD operations, like AVX-type instructions, where now the vectors have linked maybe 500 to 2,000 entries in them, and you can do this work in parallel. So you can do additions, multiplications, and also you can do different kinds of data movements. If you have an encrypted vector, I can shuffle the components of the plain text around as well. And once you can do that, you can do a lot of other interesting applications like um, uh, that are fairly easy to implement on top of this framework, such as uh, implementing um, uh, um, encrypted linear algebra. So I can take an encrypted vector and an encrypted matrix and compute the encrypted matrix vector product. So I've told you how big the ciphertexts are. Um, now I'll tell you how slow it is uh, with some typical parameters that ensure security. <laughs> One multiplication um, where I've already di uh, divided the time by the number of elements in, the, in these uh, vectors is, uh, is 1.2 milliseconds for scalar multiplication. So that's about 100,000 times slowdown uh, in terms of the time to do the uh, computation on the plain text. So we can compute on encrypted data with a slowdown of about 100,000. So we're going back in time. I looked this up. So the Univac 1 in 1951 could do one uh, floating point multiply in 2.1 milliseconds. So we're almost twice as fast as the Univac 1 was, except it's on encrypted data. So OK. Um, finally, some questions, really, that want us to think about whether any of this is meaningful or, or useful. Um, so are there any interesting blockchain smart contract applications that could benefit from fully homomorphic encryption? Now, already I believe some uh, schemes that already exist uh, do some limited form of homomorphic encryption, uh, but just additive. And uh, the question is, can you, if you want the full power of fully homomorphic encryption where you can do anything you want, um, uh, are there applications that could benefit from that? Um, the second question is, um, since I've told you how slow it is, can FHE be optimized for these applications? You really have to think hard about, you know, can you do something interesting with just a handful of multiplies and additions so that uh, there's some interesting computation taking place that, that requires um, some homomorphic computations, but it's limited. Also, can you speed things up using hardware accelerators like GPUs and FPGAs to make all of this go a lot faster? That's kind of the kind of stuff that we're actually working on nowadays. Also, just to mention one final thing, um, to really make this work, you'd have to figure out ways of getting practical implementations of zero-knowledge proofs. So, like I said, there's an encrypted state and an encrypted input. This input just comes from anywhere, and you kind of have to make sure the input is, the encrypted input is well-formed, that it's actually a valid ciphertext, and maybe that the, uh, the data that it encrypts satisfies some relationship. Otherwise, somebody could just encrypt garbage and then the smart contract would uh, update the, con the, the state with this garbage, and you just get garbage in and garbage out. So you have to have some way to restrict the inputs um, to be meaningful. There are protocols that do this, but whether or not they're practical is also an, an open question. So um, like I said, this is more of a speculative 
presentation where I just wanted to throw out some ideas for what's possible. Um, when I was listening to Whit Diffie this morning, he said that uh, something that I don't think was quite accurate. In fact, we can do fully homomorphic encryption on anything you want. There's no limitation whatsoever. It's just slightly impractical. Um, but you can do it. So if there's a way to take advantage of it, to do something practical, simple, and well-motivated, then maybe somebody could do something interesting with it. Anyway, I'm a bit over time. Uh, I guess if there's one question, I could take it, but otherwise, we'll move on. Okay, thank you. <laughs>